to help us. We've been talking about this KPFA issue at our meetings for several weeks now and realize there's a lot of rumor and innuendo and information that we don't know how to make sense out of. So we've invited you here to try and help us make sense out of it. Okay, then Emily Sykes will come up here and introduce the um, evening's events. Thank you. Good evening, and uh, yes, indeed, welcome. We're very glad you came out. Um, since this will be a kind of a um, heavy-duty discussion, as I anticipate, um, I'd like to invoke the words of uh, our visionary activist. Remember her? Carolyn Casey? She said, at times like this, what you must do is expand your ideas and your responses. And in other words, uh, try to um, not stay with the hackneyed old two sides and uh, um, kind of a negative argument of procedure, but rather as you're expanding your um, responses and getting new ideas, that you compost the anger and the um, ritualic uh, composure that you might have. So with that idea in mind, I would like to introduce the, uh, in the uh, give you the outline of the evening. <clears throat> we will have two speakers. Margie will uh, speak her thoughts for 10 minutes, and then uh, we'll have Henry Knorr speak his and describe his points of view. Uh, each will have 10 minutes. And then I'd like to um, address three people in the audience from um, that work at KPFA and are very involved. Uh, for example, uh, Les Radke will tell us about the cost of the, um, the recall. That, I think that's important. And Tracy and Brian will add whatever thoughts they have to complete the picture so that us folks who are really um, minimally involved or knowledgeable about this issue will be brought up to speed. And um, Barbara will have a 30-second warning sign and a stop sign. And the people that will come up to ask questions will come up to this mic, the audience that is, and, and line up here after the speakers, and they will get two minutes to ask a question or make a statement. So uh, I will tell you when it's time to do that. So. I will proceed to introduce our speakers. The spe first speaker, Margie Wilkinson. Yes. Uh, Margie is a native Californian and has been politically active since 1960 when she first started listening to KPFA. She worked at UC Berkeley for 40 years and was a union activist helping to organize more than one union at UC, both on the campus and system-wide. She retired in 2007 and has four main areas of activity. One is that she participates in the Berkeley schools attended by her grandchildren. She's active in her neighborhood in South Berkeley, and she's a proud member of Grandmothers Against War. And since uh, January of um, 2011, she has been the chair of the KPFA Local Station Board. Ten minutes. Okay, I'll do my best. Um, good evening. Thank you all for coming. Um, I want to paint a picture of how I see where KPFA is now, because I think it should concern us all no matter which side we're on. A little over a year ago, Pacifica abruptly took off the air what was then the top fundraiser at KPFA, the morning show. It also happened to be the youngest, most diverse, most listened to daily program produced at KPFA. The drop in fundraising was devastating. During fund drives, KPFA used to raise 40% of its money on weekdays before 10 a.m. The amount has dropped by more than half. 
based on the number of days KPFA spends in fund drives, we estimate the loss to fundraising at roughly $500,000 per year. Some say that the station is raising as much money as before. This is true, but also very misleading. To maintain its level of fundraising after the morning changes, KPFA had to increase the amount of time it spends in fund drives by 30%. We added 19 days of fundraising last year. We're budgeted to add an additional week this year. This is really bad news. We know that fund drives send many listeners elsewhere. The longer fund drives are, the more people tune out. The station spends the time between fund drives trying to bring back the listeners who were lost. And if the fund drives go on too long, there is less time to do that. And then there are fewer people left listening to ask for money next time. Let's look at our sister station in New York, WBAI. They spend one in three calendar days in some kind of fund drive. They ran a $750,000 deficit last year, and they're threatening to bring down the rest of the network. Pacifica has already been bouncing paychecks and illegally diverting money from retirement funds because BAI can't pay its own bills. BAI raises about 80% of what KPFA does. However, it broadcasts to a region with almost three times as many people as KPFA's. BAI should be raising three times what we do, not 20% less. KPFA's current fund drive is scheduled to run a whopping 23 days, and if it falls behind, it may be extended. Meanwhile, two of the three people Pacifica laid off from the morning show, Laura Privis and Brian Edwards Teagert, are back at KPFA because Pacifica couldn't make their layoffs stick. These are two people who have a proven track record of producing excellent programming and raising large amounts of money. But when it was forced to reinstate them, Pacifica chose to put them in other jobs. So how did we get here? First, I think it's important to note that Killing the Morning Show was the first time Pacifica's executive director had imposed programming changes on any of its, changes, on any of its stations since the lockout of KPFA's staff in 1989. I need a lectern. Okay. <laughs> Pacifica's executive director did this over the objections of thousands of KPFA listeners who wrote in, in protest and picketed in front of the station, I might add. She did it over the objections of KPFA's staff union, which got Brian Edwards Teeker reinstated with back pay. She did it over the objections of KPFA's local managers, both of whom quit in protest soon after. And most importantly, she did it over the objections of KPFA's elected local station board, which is supposed to be the body that ensures KPFA's staff and listeners have a say in how the station is run. Pacifica then proceeded to attack every one of these sites of resistance. It hired a $400 an hour anti-union law firm to fight KPFA's union. Though Pacifica said publicly that the decision to cut the morning show was made out of financial necessity, it spent roughly $70,000 in legal fees to keep Amy Allison from coming back to work. The cost of her salary and benefits for the balance of the fiscal year was considerably less than that. And it rejected over $60,000 offered by li listeners to restore the show. KPFA's lo local management quit not once but twice as a result of Pacifica's interference. Ahmed Anderson and Amelia Gonzalez were gone by the end of 2010. When Ahmed Pindyal was hired in early 2011 with the input of KPFA staff and local station board, he quit after just a few weeks. Then Pacifica's executive director handpicked KPFA's current interim manager without any input from KPFA staff or board. In fact, she picked him without even telling us that the last manager was gone. She had told us the former manager was taking a leave and would return, and then replaced him with a new interim general manager. And Pacifica has done everything it can to overrun, overturn the democratic will of the listeners and staff who elected safe KPFA members to the board last year. First, I'm oh, sorry, it wasn't last year, it was in 2010. Pacifica's national election supervisor, who was the candidate supported by Tracy Rosenberg for that position, disqualified three staff members' ballots after the vote was counted. She removed their individual ballots, identified by code numbers printed on the ballots, from the counted votes, and as a result, changed the outcome of the staff election. This blatantly illegal action was overturned by a court injunction. Then Pacifica barred two of our representatives from taking their seats on the national board, the one that actually has some power over the executive director. This was overturned by court injunction as well, but Pacifica defied the injunction and didn't change course 
until the judge scheduled a contempt of court hearing, ordering the chair of the PMB who lives in LA and the secretary who lives in New York to come to Oakland prepared to surrender themselves to Alameda County sheriffs. These maneuvers kept our representatives from taking their seats on the Pacifica board for the first six months of their term. Later, if I have an opportunity, I'd like to tell you more about what, happened, what is happening with this. <clears throat> this was the point at which it was decided that the only course was to run a recall campaign. The point at which Pacifica had violated all the mechanisms of accountability, of local control, of democratic process that KPFA's listeners and staff fought so hard for 10 years ago. So let me tell you why we're recalling Tracy in particular. Because she breaks the rules, because she, at every step of the way, Tracy has been behind the problems we're dealing with. Let me backtrack. We think the morning show was targeted because Brian Edwards Teagert was one of Tracy's strongest opponents when he served as a staff representative on the KPFA local station board. Tracy had already stage managed an unsuccessful attempt to get him off the board through a staff recall. It failed by a two to one margin, but not until Brian's tenure on the board was over. In September 2010, by her own admission, Tracy drew up a list of people to lay off at KPFA. Again, by her own admission, the list did not follow seniority order as required by KPFA's union contract. She presented this list to Cape Pacifica's executive director at a secret meeting with other national board members, and Pacifica acted on it. When KPFA's union proposed cost-saving measures to avoid layoffs, more than enough to save Amy Allison's job, Tracy told a meeting of the Pacifica National Finance Committee that it should discuss them and then vote them down to send a message. Pacifica's executive director, Arlene Engelhardt, then rejected the union's proposals, citing the vote of the Finance Committee. When Pacifica handed out morning show's time slot to its political supporters, in violation of Pacifica's bylaws, Tracy picked most of the people who took over the air. Peter Phillips, who got one of those time slots, has confirmed this in writing. Then, without the knowledge or permission of anyone in any position of responsibility at KPFA, Tracy misappropriated a list of emails for all KPFA's members, loaded it onto a server outside of KPFA's control, and started sending out emails purporting to be from KPFA, promoting the morning mix and nothing else. This was all in violation of KPFA's email policy, and after an extensive investigation, the LSB censured her for her actions. In January 2011, when Pacifica voted to bar our local representatives from being seated on the national board, it was Tracy's motion that Pacifica voted through. In fact, to get her motion through fast enough to keep Dan Siegel and Laura Privis from taking their seats, Tracy actually misled the Pacifica national board. She said her motion to overturn the results of our election was a product of a committee that she chairs. In fact, the committee had never seen the motion, much less voted on it. At this point, we simply can't do the job that you all elected us to do, to put KPFA on a healthy footing again with Tracy in office, and that's why we're asking you to remove her. Tracy Rosenberg has consistently violated Pacifica and KPFA's rules, is openly unapologetic about those violations, and refuses even to acknowledge them as violations. Tracy's defenders will tell you that this is a financial burden on KPFA. We think trace, removing Tracy is the one way to get KPFA back on a sound financial footing. Tracy's defenders will tell you that this recall is divisive, as if her actions over the past year and a half have not been even more divisive. But what we will say is, that this, is this. At every turn, we have tried to find solutions and common ground. KPFA's union proposed cost-saving measures to avoid layoffs. This is a union whose members were willing to sacrifice their own pay to save another union member's job. But Pacifica rejected them at Tracy's urging. Save KPFA raised $63,000 in pledges from listeners to restore the morning show, but Tracy dismissed it as a novelty check. And Pacifica rejected the pledges, opting instead to pay an anti-union law firm more than $70,000 to fight to keep Amy Allison off the air. Every time KPFA's staff and listeners have tried to put solutions on the table, to work through this crisis, they have been rebuffed, and Tracy has been at the center of it. If you want to diminish divisiveness at KPFA, I urge you to vote yes on the recall of Tracy Rosenberg. Thank you, Mallory. And now, is this working? Yes. 
we will, I will introduce um, Henry Knorr. Henry Knorr has been an activist since the 1960s and a member of KPFA's local station board for five years. His checkered work history included stints as a printer, a community college teacher, including in a police training program, a vertical boring mill operator at GE, an academic researcher on Soviet society and on the Solidarity Movement in Poland, and a journalist specializing in personal computers and related technology. In 2003, he was fired from his job as a columnist at the San Francisco Chronicle for expressing support for Palestinian rights and for getting arrested in demonstrations protesting the start of the war on Iraq. He is currently retired, lives in Berkeley, and devotes most of his time to activism around Palestine, labor solidarity, Occupy Oakland, and other causes. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, I'm not sure. I look around, I see a lot of familiar faces, and I suspect uh, most people here have already made up their minds. But uh, nevertheless, it's good to run through these things, I think. And thank you to the organizers for making that possible. Um, Margie had a lot of accusations. I'm not going to try to rebut them one by one. Perhaps Tracy later on might want to speak to some of them. I want to make a couple of points about them and then go on to the main things I wanted to say. Um, First is that most of those accusations involve things that Tracy did not do personally. They uh, involve things that the Pacifica National Management, the ED, uh, allegedly did, or the PNB did. Tracy supposedly had some influence in them, but um, in fact, she's not responsible for most of those things. Um, a couple of specifics I do want to comment on. Um, I already said that Tracy drew up a list of people to be laid off. In fact, what she did was bring the seniority list because the union contract requires that uh, layoffs when necessary be made primarily on the basis of seniority. Uh, you may have heard about a hit list, about a purge, and so on. Um, in fact, it was uh, all based on, on the um, on the seniority list, which gives management the, the language in the contract gives you the gives management certain leeway to um, take account of skills and and so on. And uh, management did do that, but based it primarily on on seniority. But again, that wasn't Tracy; that was specific of management. And um, the last thing, I guess, just very briefly, the misappropriation of the email list. Tracy can tell you that list was provided to her by. Uh, by Pacifica, all she did with it, uh, since KPFA doesn't have an old, it's an email blast service to do, uh, you know, high volume email when, um, well, well, maybe it does now, but it didn't then. And uh, the morning mix people were struggling to get their program off the ground, to improve it and to attract an audience, decided that a good thing to do would be to send out email announcing what was coming up in the coming week in, on their program. And they asked if they could use uh, Tracy's email blast service. Um, and she agreed. If you look at the email in question, all it does is promote the morning mix for that week. That was the big crime. Um, all right, on to the main things I want to say. I, I have three, three points. Um, if I'll try to go through them pretty quickly, make sure I get to all of them. If there's time, maybe we'll go back over some of them. Um, but I'll try to remember, uh, from this perspective, at least the three main points. If you read the recall petition and the proponents' campaign materials closely, you'll see that the whole thing is not really about misconduct, or even alleged misconduct, but really about politics. Not wider world politics, but differences over how to respond to the unfortunate reality that KPFA and Pacifica have for several years been in very dire financial straits, and in the fall of 2010, we're really teetering on the brink of bankruptcy, actual real bankruptcy, uh, which would have cost us KPFA and all the other licenses. Um, specifically, the recall is a maneuver by one faction within KPFA represented tonight, um, within KPFA governance that is represented here by Margie, which currently has a very narrow majority on the LSB 
to bump an effective representative of the other faction, the minority on the board, which I'm part of, um, to capture her seat on the LSD, and in particular to capture her seat on the Pacifica National Board in defiance of the principle of proportional representation, which is the basis of the, the, government, the kind of democracy embodied in our bylaws, and then to use that seat in an effort to oust Pacifica's national management, the uh, executive director, Arlene Engelhardt, and um, the CFO, LeVarne Williams. If you read the, their websites, you'll see that that's uh, very clearly the objective. Okay, that, that's the first point. It's all about politics. It's not about individual misconduct, even there, you know, there are some strange accusations, all of which can be, uh, all of which I think are grossly distorted. Second point, factionalism and infighting, of course, you, you all probably know, are nothing new to KPFA and Pacifica. Sad to say, I guess, but <laughs> anybody who's been around is very used to it. But this recall campaign is taking nastiness to a whole new level. Um, over and above vicious public attacks on opponents, on Tracy, on station management, on Arlene Engelhardt, the executive director, things that I think are, I'm not a lawyer, but to me they sound, I think they're slanderous. Um, over and above all that, we're spending very scarce resources at a time when, uh, I guess Les is going to talk more about this, but I estimated that the cost of the foundation is more than $20,000 to, to run this recall. Um, we're, it also, another thing you may not have tuned into is that it brings a kind of, you know, play to, pay to play approach to our politics in. This, this already happened with the LSB elections when the safe KPFA faction started sending these mailings out. Well, these mailings cost a lot, like eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars. Um, it it means that, and the side that I'm on didn't want to do that, but we found that we were forced. If only one side did that, they had a huge advantage because um, there was no way to reach all the voters without responding. We found ourselves forced to look for rich people to grovel for money. And, and, and so on, we get into the same kind of dynamic that you have in American electoral politics, where only people have money or have friends with money or are willing to do what rich people want or, or can somehow beg, borrow, and scrape to get the funds, can participate. Now we bring in this recall approach where any side that, that can raise the money to put out a mail, to you know, collect some signatures and put out a mailing like this, can start reversing the results of elections. Um, and. Finally, I, mentioned, I said this before, but it really undermines, this really is undermining the principle of proportional representation of different perspectives. The way the LSB, uh, the way the election to the Pacific National Board works is that the LSB gets to pick four people. Um, one's a staff rep, and then there are three uh, listener reps. On the, because we use a single kind of proportional representation voting, known as single transferable voting, whatever, um, the majority is guaranteed. Two of those three seats in the minority gets the third. If this recall goes through, the minority, which represents about, what, ten members of the board, um, will lose its sole seat, its sole representation on the Pacific and National Board. There'll be one seat to fill, the majority, majority will then fill it and have all the representation and the very large minority that my side represents will be completely unrepresented in, in the uh, in the PNB. Um, okay, third point. Um, I don't agree with Tracy about everything in terms of substance, style, whatever. You know, I don't know that I agree with anybody about everything. Um, but I will say that she works harder than anybody I know to, for the benefit of the station and the network. Um, I don't know, people who haven't been inside Pacifica Governance may not know that the main form it takes is these, well, these sometimes very long, tedious meetings, uh, one day a month for the LSB, and then four days every couple of quarters nowadays, I guess, for the Pacifica National Board, but in between, interminable conference calls on the phone, three, four, five hours, um, with f committees 
Um, Tracy being on the PNB, on the uh, being treasurer of the foundation, and uh, by virtue of that, a member of the coordinating committee and chair of the National Finance Committee is, I don't know how many times a week has to sit through these incredible meetings. Um, they're very tense, I understand. Um, the committee that I'm on hardly ever makes quorum, so, <laughs> but, uh, but they're, they're particularly, you know, they're very tense in these times because frankly, you know, the survival of the network and the, our stations is at stake. Uh, people's jobs are at stake. Uh, this this is a this is serious business. Every station has has divisions and factions and intense disagreements. They all come together at the national level, <laughs> and Chasey sits through these things for hours on end, and and does her best to struggle through to make it you know out of to build the kind of uh, compromises and alliances that, that that make things finally get decided to come up with budgets and approve budgets or, or, or point out flaws in the budgets of the stations and try to keep the damn ship afloat. Um, and it's in considerable part due to her efforts that, that Pacific and KPFA have over the last year moved back from the, from the abyss uh, uh, that we were on a year or a year and a half ago, the brink of bankruptcy, and if not to a good financial situation, at least to one that's uh, not uh, not immediately disastrous, and I, you know, she does all this on top of a of a major demanding day job as executive director of the Media Alliance, an important media reform advocacy, media rights advocacy group. So, just in winding up to anyone serious about say saving KPFA, I would say the last thing you want to do is recall Tracy. Vote no on the recall. Tell your friends to do likewise. And if you want more information, go to stopthekpfarecall.org or to supportkpfa.org. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's amazing how much information uh, came out of you two people. Uh, and we have three more to give us more information. I need to have you let's talk about the money that seems to be the, well, I don't have to say what it is. So tell us how much this is all going to cost and uh, so forth. I'll, I'll try to be fair. Please introduce I am, oh, my, yeah, my name is Les Radke. Les Radke, introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Les Radke. I think I was brought here because I was national election supervisor a couple of times. I was a local election supervisor at... KPFA and at KPFT. Um, I'm just a messenger, and so as a messenger, I'm not responsible for any of the decisions that are being made. The decisions that are being made are right now a little peculiar to me because uh, the PNB voted that they will determine who is going to be the recall supervisor, and they turned it over to Summer, who's chair of the PNB. Um, they've already had rejections of a couple of people who volunteered to be recall supervisor and it was decided uh, by summer that the best thing to do is to hire an organization to do it. Um, so I'm not going to give you accurate figures. I'm going to give you uh, sort of outlines of what is going to happen. Uh, we are sending these out first class mail. That's 47 cents for 20,247 or so um, people. So we're talking about $10,000 just for the mailing. We're talking five to $10,000 for printing costs depending on which printer go, uh, we go to. Uh, the one recall supervisor that they were going to hire said he would charge $1,600, but as an organization, you can expect a lot more. So we're talking probably on the order of $30,000. I'm just a messenger again, uh, and until, until the printers, until the people who are doing the recall are brought together, we won't really know what exactly how much money we're talking about. But well, we are talking twenty to thirty thousand dollars, probably. That's all I can say. Thank you, Les. 
And, and you, you, oh well, I'll ask that later. All right, now we have Tracy and we have Brian. Which of you wants to go first? Don't knock me over as you. Okay. Um, all right, so three minutes is challenging here because a whole bunch of stuff was said and I'm guessing a whole bunch more stuff is going to be said. Um, my thoughts about this recall is that basically um, we're taking a whole bunch of stuff and kind of throwing it against the wall to see what might stick. So I'm going to address a couple of things, but I can't possibly address all the things. So if you have specific questions about something that I haven't mentioned, I will stick around after the forum, talk to me, I will answer your questions. Um, Let's start with some numbers. KPFA lost 30% of its listener support and its members between 2006 and 2010 before any programming changes. That's an important thing to say. That's over a million dollars in annual revenue. Not because the morning show was taken off the air, but because the economy tanked or because people weren't listening to KPFA as much as they had been before. In 2009, KPFA lost $575,000. In 2010, it lost $585,000. This is not because of WBAI in New York. KPFA lost its money all by itself, a million dollars in two years. The bad news was a million dollars was exactly what KPFA had in the bank. So at the end of two years, that money was gone. The Pacifica Foundation as a whole in 2010 lost $1.975 million. That's a scary amount of money, and it still hasn't been paid back. In the year that I have been treasurer, that amount has been reduced by $1.5 million. This year, we improved by $1.5 million. Instead of losing $585,000, KPFA lost $35,000. That's an improvement of over $550,000. We are more stable financially than we were. Secondly, there, the sustainable budget, there wasn't any sustainable budget. When you've lost Suggestions about how to save less than $200,000, mostly by not contributing to shared services, which of course all the stations need to chip into or they don't get paid, like Free Speech Radio News or Democracy Now!, that's not a sustainable budget. I mean, first of all, you've still got a six-figure gap. And secondly, um, not paying bills from one division doesn't make them paid. It simply shifts the burden from one station to the other. And I wish I could say that the other Pacific stations were making money hands over fist and could bail out KPFA, but it's, but it's not true. Um, I guess a third thing that I, well, let me say two other things quickly if I can. Um, yes, attorneys are, ex oh wow, I'm, 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 I'm not going to make it through. Yes, attorneys are expensive. The labor attorney currently being used by Pacifica, the same one that's used by KQED and public broadcasting, in Northern California. It's the same one used by the fine arts museums. It's the same one used by the Jewish Community Center in San Francisco. I mean, maybe all of these institutions should be boycotted, can recall too. That's possible. But I'm just saying, that's who the labor attorney is. Um, I am going to say one thing that I really object to. Um, Amit Pandayal is a friend of mine. Uh, he was KPFA's manager, very briefly. Um, the assertion that was made regarding why he walked out of KPFA is a patent lie, a total absurdity, and frankly, insulting both to him and to any version of objective reality. Um, the activities of the local station board and the Safe KPFA faction in particular were directly responsible for his decision that life was too short to try to manage the madhouse of KPFA and to imply anything else is slander of, of the first degree. It's shameful. Um, I have like a million other things to say, so I'm hoping there'll be an opportunity to, to say some of them. But that's up to you, and thank you for listening. Yeah, we will uh, ask you lots of questions, Tracy, and that depends on the audience. So. Uh, I, I don't think you have to worry about not being able to say anything anymore. All right, Brian, would you like to say uh, I'm Brian Edwards, I work at KPFA. 
Um, I guess I'll stick to, because you've heard a lot of things coming at you from different directions, I'll stick to actually areas where there's maybe room for a consensus understanding of reality. I don't think anyone disputes the magnitude of the financial crisis confronting KPFA and Pacifica a year ago or today. Um, and, and I think that's important. What I do think is disputed is this notion that is only inferred and never made explicit that getting rid of the morning show was somehow a remedy to that situation. Getting rid of the morning show ultimately eliminated one position, Amy Allison's. She was making $20 an hour for 27 hours a week. That did not plug a $550,000 deficit. What plugged the deficit was that the managers who quit and discussed over how Pacifica intervened at our station, had spent the year cutting hours from jobs, including my own, getting union members enrolled in the work sharing program. They had put a voluntary severance package on the table that seven people took. In other words, the cutting was done, or largely done. And in the end, the things our union was willing to put on the table, like changing our benefits structure uh, for Medicare eligible employees was enough to keep someone like Amy Allison on. And I want to talk about the impact of that cut because the morning show raised, depending on the fund drive, 20 to 25 percent of what KPFA took in. It raised three times more than it cost. It produced a net subsidy to the station somewhere in the order of $270,000. So clearly the morning show is something if you're worried about the finances you would want to keep. So what were the options? Well, Two days of fundraising would cover Amy Allison's salary for more than a year. Instead, we cut the morning show, and as you heard Margie say, added 19 days of fundraising. This is not a good move. The pledges that were put up that Save KPFA organized would have saved Amy Allison's job with no added cost to KPFA. Instead, we got $70,000 on Folger and Levin. There were options out there that would put KPFA in much better shape than it is now. The question you have to ask is, why wouldn't any rational manager take them? And the conclusion we've been left with is that, finally, the dysfunction that has existed for a long time at the board level in KPFA and Pacifica has finally penetrated the programming level. And we've been programmed by vendetta, by political vendetta. And that is not just a sad thing for KPFA, but it bodes very poorly for the future of our station and the future of the network. And you know, I, I think this is what it's important to focus on, is what's good for our station and what's going to get us moving forward. And so I'd like you to think about that when you make your decision about how to vote on the recall. And I have 30 seconds to spare. <laughs> so now, we line up here those folks who can formulate a question, uh, digging out all of these complications. And I think the best way is if you'd line up and, 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 and don't be shy. Uh, good. And you get uh, two minutes or less, or Barbara will keep track of uh, what's happening. Introduce yourself and uh, away we go. People can make statements as well, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm David Schoenbrunn, and this is my statement. While I think the Bush administration needs to be prosecuted for war crimes, I do not want to go back and relitigate the demise of the morning show. Given all the critical challenges to peace and the environment in the world today, I suspect that the recall movement is incredibly misguided. This controversy seems totally stale and unnecessary to me. I think this problem goes to the depth of who we are as radicals. I'm forced to think that people are choosing to conduct their lives of radical struggle within the KPFA family 
because it's easier and less depressing than taking it out into the world where it's sorely needed. My message to everyone here, there are far bigger problems for us to deal with than an internal squabble like this. I don't want KPFA to be sidetracked by this. It's far too important to me and to all of us here. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Kate Cullen, and uh, I was hoping that this meeting was to discuss ways to put the recall election in motion. Um, I have to say that I'm appalled and angry that the will of those petitioning for this recall is being ignored. And I view this evening's meeting as an attempt to <coughs> obfuscate and retroactively subvert our efforts to hold the recall election. Um, I am particularly angry that it's, there's always plausible sounding reasons why it's not convenient to um, adhere to the rules that have taken so long to be put in place, um, and I don't think that should be lost in the shuffle. Well, first a couple of comments, and both of these sides have been at each other's throats for years, and that one could say that one is worse than the other, pardon? Oh, I'm sorry, my name is Regina Carey, thank you, um, and a member of the um, is, is, is has done things more egregious than the other, you know, that's not even here nor there, uh, they've both been atrocious. and. For me, when I look at what had happened to both Gus Newport and Roy Campanella, it makes me even less willing to take a side on this. But having gone through the election process when I ran for the LSB um, and had a firsthand experience at both sides, well, this is just ridiculous. You know, it's really not about KPFA. It's about power and who wants power and who wants it. Uh, it's a waste of money to do a recall in a community-sponsored radio station, a community-supported radio station, that's taking our money. Listening had been dropping off on the shows in KPFA for a very long time. Now, I want to get back just a little, because I have a question for, is it Mary or Margie? Margie. Margie. Um, people always throw out things, and they make it sound as if it's real and, and true. And you said that the judge had issued an order for the for two of these people to turn themselves in. I have never seen the judge's order. So if you have a copy of the judge's order, make it available. Absolutely. I mean, there were a number of things you said the judge had done, and none of those things have been, have, and they're all public, especially if he that's said right. you have to turn yourself in. That's right. You know, I mean, that's not just turn yourself in. That's issuing an order to have them picked up, too. So where, when did that happen? What was the date? It was, um, it was in June. Of, what happened was the judge... Mic, had, okay, sorry. Uh, the judge... Mm. Yeah, leave it turned on. Okay. All the way up. Okay. Now? Okay. Um, the judge in Alameda County had issued a, an, a um, what do you call it, a temporary restraining order. Um, forbidding the Pacifica National Board from refusing to seat two of the candidate, two of the directors who've been elected by the KPFA local station board. The um, Pacifica National Board decided to um, violate the, the temporary restraining order and continued to refuse to seat the two individuals. The judge then set a date for issuing, um, no, the judge uh, set a date for a contempt of court hearing, and I, I'm not in, I'm not in charge of this, but under the California state law, uh, at a contempt of court hearing um, where an institution is the defendant, then the two people from the institution and the judge determined by our bylaws that it was the secretary and the chair um, had to make themselves available in court on a certain day, and if he ruled that they were in violation of his order, then they should be prepared to surrender to jail. And I have, I have seen the document and okay, I... Okay, but that's, that's not 
saying that he required them to turn themselves in. No, no. I, I, so, so I'm I, sorry. I'm sorry. So, so what I said was, <laughs> I didn't. I no, you specifically that. said that they were required to turn themselves in. No. And that is not the case. Well, what he said was. I said what I said was exactly what it says in his order. Okay. Okay. Which is that he that they had to be prepared to submit themselves to the. Say prepared. And I am not either of those people. Right. That's right. But, He's but, not. That's okay. true. Absolutely true. So Tracy's anyway, what I just want to get back to. I'm yes. Sure. You know, when we get misinformation, when it's when it's twisted or stated oh. in just a way to make it sound worse or more egregious, it does a disservice. It treats us as if we're ignoramuses. And I just don't like that. Okay. You know, and I haven't made up my mind about either one of these sides, um, but I think the recall is stupid. Thank you. Well, let me just say that the, what the 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 judge scheduled a contempt of court hearing, ordering the chair of the PNB. Um, to, who lives in Los Angeles, and the secretary lives in New York, to come to Oakland, prepared to surrender themselves to the Alameda County Sheriff's. And that's exactly what he did, with the understanding that that would, was a possible result of the contempt of court hearing. I'm sorry I didn't say all those words. But if anyone would like to see the document, I'd be happy to share it. Um, I just want to give a little bit of background about this. Um, the, the issue is about uh, Dan Siegel, who was a member of the PND, and, I mean a member of the LSB, um, and was elected by the LSB to the Pacifica National Board. Pacifica's bylaws say that if, you, if a member of uh, any part of the governance structure accepts a political appointment, he or she ceases to be a member of the governance, that you can't stay in, in Pacifica governance if you have a political appointment. Doesn't say if you have an elected post or if you're or, or anything. It says a political appointment. It says public it, office. It does say it, an elected. It says it says it says a political appointment. Look it up. I'll look it up in a minute. Two separate uh, places: uh, political office and political appointment. Okay. Both um, Mayor Jean Kwan announced that she was appointing Dan Siegel as her attorney in City Hall. He recently resigned from that non-appointment. In his view, he put out a press release announcing that he was resigning from something, according to him, he was never appointed to. So the Pacifica National Board, in good faith, believed that because he had accepted this publicly announced appointment, which everybody knew was not an elected office, that under the bylaws he was no longer eligible to be part of the government. Now, it went to court, there were all kinds of legal complexities and so on, but it was not an absurd position was not some crazy, you know, singling him out in a political vendetta or something else. It was a it was a good faith interpretation of what seemed to uh, to, to me and to many other people to be clear language in the in the bylaws. Okay. I don't can you, can you move on can I we move on? Okay. It's time for questions. Okay. <coughs> Good evening, everybody. I'm Chandra Houtman. I'd like to respond to a few things that were said. Um, in 2003, leading up to the Iraqi war, um, KPFA was at its heyday financially because of the coverage of the Iraqi war and so many anti-war activists on the left. It raised the most money that it had ever raised, and as a result of that, hired the most staff it had ever had. Well, after the Iraq war continued for several years, listenership started dropping, income and revenue started dropping, and in 2008, the Pacifica National Board ordered, mandated, all five Pacifica stations to cut their staff by 25%. Four stations did so, KPFA refused. KPFA was then under the leadership of Len Len Riccio, an ally of the then concerned listeners now calling themselves Safe KPFA. But don't confuse yourself. This is not the Safe KPFA from 1999. Okay, this is the new Safe KPFA. You know, we have Newspeak. Okay, so KPFA did not cut their budget. The uh, staffing was the highest of any Pacifica station in the network. How do you pay for salaries? Salaries uh, account for the majority of the, of the budget. 
So KPFA was losing money. Um, so that's one point that I want to make. Um, now this is something that I find fascinating because I didn't know this until last week when this was made, stated publicly. I knew part of it. When the new morning show hosts were hired, or I should say appointed, Brian Edward Steger and Amy Allison, they were not open competitive hires. KPFA hasn't had open competitive hires in years except for general manager. Um, they were appointed positions. They were appointed by Lem Lem Riccio. So they were handpicked. Amy Allison um, did not um, know how to work on the radio. She, so she had voice coaching, paid for by KPFA. She had a producer, Brian and, uh, Brian and Amy had a producer, um, who then uh, worked with her and also wrote her script because she didn't have the political awareness and the uh, radio knowledge to um, actually be an articulate morning show host. She was a political activist. Amy is a great person. She has a lot of left credentials. No one can dispute her for that. But the point was, how did she get there? And then why did she leave? Okay, and I just want to say one other thing. Um, then the morning show producer, uh, Laura Privis, a member of the Concerned Listeners, refused to work with the new morning mix. So they've been without a producer ever since the morning mix has been in operation. And that might reflect some issues related to the quality of the show or not. You think about that yourself. For comparison to Mitch Jezerich, who has at least three producers working all members of Concerned Listeners who refuse to work with anybody allied with current KPFA management. Thank you. Right. Okay. I, we, there were so many personal attacks in there. You we need a way to rebut it. Personal attacks all night. Nothing new. Not only did Amy Allison go through an open hire, she and the other finalists for the position were auditioned on air so listeners could provide feedback before they picked the person who went on the morning show. Some of you might remember those broadcasts. Exactly. I went through an open hire when I was hired at KPFA. I had no prior involvement in KPFA politics at that point. Um, I was transferred into my position as part of a money-saving move when I was moved into the morning show at KPFA. Amy Allison when I worked with her, did not have anyone writing scripts for her, and is one of the most intelligent, articulate, and political people I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Your description of her, Chandra, is condescending and insulting. And I didn't think we talked that way about people in the 21st century. <laughs> Mitch Jezerich has a part of one paid producer working for him. He also has a large cadre of volunteers who work with him because they like working on a show that does good work. And you can hear it in the show. Laura Privis did work with The Morning Mix for several weeks. She was frustrated. She told me that no one on The Morning Mix would let her have a say in any part of how the show was run. She was our executive producer on The Morning Show. She was the final authority on what we put on the air. She moved on with the agreement of management to working with shows that were willing to put her to work. Tracy, do you want to thank you? Yes, equal time to say. Sure. Um, yeah. I'm not a big fan of emotionalism and everything that's, you know, vendettas. Um, the layoffs to the morning show didn't happen because anyone's a bad person or to punish anyone or because the quality of the show was inadequate. Uh, KPFA may one day do program evaluations, and I hope that they will because I think that that would be a, a good process, but they didn't. The reason that the layoffs happened was because they ran out of money. Any aspersions to the contrary are based on nothing but hard feelings. Um, continuing on, you know, there's some of these accusations just get so weird. I heard something about engineering a staff recall against Brian Edwards Teekert. I mean, that's patently absurd. I'm not a staff member. I can't possibly do that. Um, 
I think actually that there's a staff member here who might have signed that recall petition, and if so, I hope she'll say something. Ruth Ann Spinner. I'm sure, whatever she says, it won't be that I hypnotized her and forced her to sign it. Um, you know, we have to be reality-based in the things that we're saying. Um, I'm a listener. I don't recall staff members. Other staff members recall staff members, and maybe they should have, and maybe they shouldn't, but that's between them. Um, okay, two more quick points, and I'm sorry, it's just there's so much stuff flying around. Um, the morning show costs two hundred thousand dollars annually to produce, not twenty-seven thousand dollars. There are two part-time hosts, and then there were one point seven five producers. It was the most heavily produced show at KPFA. Therefore, in order to accommodate the show, you are spending $200,000 of resources every year in payroll and benefits, plus the share of the overhead, the infrastructure, and all of that stuff. Um, to imply that $27,000 fixes the whole thing is craziness. It was the most expensive show on KPFA. The two hosts had the least seniority of any other program hosts on KPF. That's a lie. <laughs> and you know it. Hey, Chris, stop. It's not even remotely a lie. Mitch Jezerich. John Hamilton. A liar, and she has John a liar. Hamilton is not a program host. He's a okay. news reporter. And what's Mitch one. Jezerich? Okay. Brian Jezerich was a head of Amy Allison. He was higher up on the seniority scale. You were not. That's that's correct. So Ms. when you Allison said the two hosts, you were allowed to speak when you were up at the mic. Would you let her please speak and be a gentleman about like it? Like I said, this is this is emotionalism, and what it comes down to is eliminating one host of a two-host program that was on in in the morning had logistical issues. On the aggregate, the program hosts were the lowest. And it is true. This letters and politics could have been removed from the air instead of the morning show. I don't think if that happened, Safe KPFA would be that much happier than they are with the decision that was made. Those two program hosts, those two programs are the lowest on the seniority chart. And I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but I sat in a meeting where we said, oh my God, we lost half a million dollars for the second year in a row. What the heck are we going to do? And I heard a whole bunch of suggestions, and those suggestions were way bigger distortions of the seniority list than anything that actually happened. I remember pointing out that Dennis Bernstein was number nine from the top on the seniority list. I remember pointing out the Davy D was number 13 from the top. It was on KPFA for 30 years with some host or the other, and people grew up with it and grew old with it and are sorry to see it go. And I understand that nobody wants to lose their job in a layoff. Journalism jobs today are hard to get. But the entire radio station was going to go under. Action had to be taken. Sometimes management doesn't make people popular, but you have to do what you have to do. And in the end, the people that are paid to be the managers, which is not me, they made a choice. And trying to burn people at the stake for the choices that others made, it's a waste of time, it's a waste of money.